So hello again and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation's Wellness Wednesdays webinar. I'm Krista Ellis, Community Engagement Manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. Helping me behind the scenes are my colleagues Laura Cameron and Danielle Agpolo. The Parkinson's Foundation is a nonprofit focused on bettering the lives of those living with Parkinson's through improving care and advancing research. Importantly, everything we do is in close concert with our community to ensure that our actions are aligned with the needs and priorities of those living with Parkinson's disease. Today, we will learn the basics of clinical research as well as the benefits of participating. We will explore what you may expect and how to get involved in Parkinson's research. Again, we are recording today's presentation. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's recording and more resources in the coming days. The Parkinson's Foundation provides weekly education and wellness programs virtually through our PD Health at Home series, including Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, Expert Briefings, and our Spanish language programming, EP Salud en Casa. Join us for our next Wellness Wednesday on December 6th, where we will explore how to eat and feel well through the holidays. In this virtual program, we will explore how to maintain a healthy diet during the holiday season while effectively managing symptoms. We will delve into the latest nutritional research related to Parkinson's disease and be available to address any questions you might have regarding Parkinson's and dietary choices. You can find out more about this virtual event next week and register for our PD Health at Home events at parkinson.org slash pdhealth. The Parkinson's Foundation is proud to provide resources and support to our veterans living with Parkinson's disease. You can view our past events by tuning into our YouTube channel or accessing the recordings on our webpage. The next live event will be hosted on December 14th, where we will address environmental exposures for veterans living with Parkinson's. Learn more about these events and register to attend at parkinson.org veterans. We'd like to take this moment to thank Prevail Therapeutics for their generous support of the Parkinson's Foundation's mission. Thank you, Prevail. And without further ado, I would love to bring our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. James Beck, on camera to join us and walk us through understanding why we should participate in PD research. Jim? Thanks very much, uh, Krista. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today from a slightly different perspective uh, instead of a moderator of expert briefings. I've hoped to share with you today and in part with everyone listening why you as a person with Parkinson's should participate in research. If we go to the next slide, um, we can begin the, our presentation. So research is important because there have been advancements in controlling the symptoms through um, PD medications and surgery, all because of research. Unfortunately, I think we all recognize that these advancements aren't stopping the disease and, and unfortunately, there's still no cure. Uh, next, please. And the question that everyone's always asking is why? Well, it really comes down to the fact that there's still a lot we don't know about Parkinson's disease. The next slide, what we don't know um, is you know, brief, but all encompassing. We don't know what causes Parkinson's. We don't know why Parkinson's progresses. And we still, not yet, don't know how to stop Parkinson's. That said, um, I shouldn't say that we haven't been trying. There have been a number of clinical trials that have been focused on trying to stop or slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. And, and these are listed on the right, uh, involving a variety of different compounds, all with the goal of trying to stop Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, they have not succeeded. Nevertheless, research remains our most Im important and best chance for overcoming Parkinson's disease and putting a stop to it forever. So over time, we've learned more and more about Parkinson's disease and improved this knowledge, getting to the point where we now have a number of clinical trials that are in process. And those clinical trials are dependent upon people, you living with Parkinson's disease in order to participate in them, in order to advance them, in order to understand whether these drugs, chemicals, compounds are efficacious in stopping Parkinson's disease. So in the next slide, so that your participation is incredibly important because it advances our general knowledge about Parkinson's disease. It allows us to help identify new and better treatments for Parkinson's disease. And it can help others living with Parkinson's disease. This is a gift that keeps on giving. Your participation in research is incredibly important. So 
I set the framework for why we want to get into research. But now let me introduce my colleague, Evelyn Stevens, who can get into the details of what is research, what is clinical research, and how can one get involved? Evelyn? Thanks, Jim. Hi, everyone. I'm Evelyn Stevens, Director of Community Engagement at the Parkinson's Foundation. And at the Parkinson's Foundation, we work really hard to make sure that research is inclusive. And what I mean by inclusive, um, that being my primary role on our team as Director of Community Engagement, is that we work with researchers and scientists to ensure that the Parkinson's community, people with Parkinson's and care partners, are engaged early and often while they are developing drugs and treatments for Parkinson's. You all should be a part of this process. And to make that partnership a reality, I also train people with Parkinson's and care partners in the research process, helping them to develop the skills and knowledge to work right alongside researchers and scientists, sharing their lived experience and expertise to really ensure that clinical trials are meaningful, effective, and efficient for the Parkinson's community. People with Parkinson's and care partners that complete this training are called research advocates. And you're actually gonna hear from a research advocate today, Kevin Kwok, um, in a little bit. Um, but I'd like to spend some time talking about the basics of research, and then we'll invite Jim back to provide an example of a research study here at the Parkinson's Foundation. So let's just start with what is a clinical trial. Um, so clinical trials are one type of research. Um, and I think the gold star to remember here is that clinical trials are research done with people. The goal of clinical trials is to answer scientific questions. Clinical trials are important. As Jim had mentioned, they really help us find new treatments and they also help us um, compare those new treatments to standards of care. So the treatments that have already been established. They also help us understand the progression of Parkinson's disease, and they also help us identify genetic factors that can trigger Parkinson's. It's only through clinical trials that we can find better ways to treat or cure a disease. They allow us to improve the care of people with Parkinson's. So why do people take part in clinical trials? There are a number of reasons people have shared um, why they take part in clinical trials. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those reasons. One reason that we've heard is that people say it really helps them um, help their family. The information from a clinical trial is beneficial for their family and their community. Another reason that we've heard is that taking part in clinical trials allows them to contribute to diversity in research. And this is really important. We wanna make sure, again, in my role at the foundation is to make sure that research is inclusive. And we wanna make sure that the drugs that are being developed for Parkinson's are representative and can be generalized to everyone that has Parkinson's. And so it's really important that we bring in those diverse backgrounds in terms of race, ethnicities, geographic locations of people who live in urban areas and rural areas, all different kinds of ages and genders so that the drugs that are being developed are inclusive of everyone. One of the other things that we heard about why you should take part in clinical trials is that it's a way to stop the progression of Parkinson's disease. We have also heard that taking part in clinical trials really advances treatment and helps us get to a, a space of finding a cure for Parkinson's. And then we've heard that there's a chance uh, to better understand my health. So taking part in a clinical trial will give you information that can help you understand your health. And lastly, taking part in clinical trials is better ways to treat and manage Parkinson's disease. I'm going to spend some time talking a little bit about the types of clinical studies. So one type of clinical study is an observational study. And an observational study tracks a person's health over a period of time to better understand Parkinson's. And this helps us think of new ideas on curing or treating the disease. Some examples that an observational study could include are things like studying the genetics of people with Parkinson's disease and their families, or using blood tests or an MRI, which is a picture of the brain to understand Parkinson's disease. Another type of clinical study, which you'll hear a lot about today um, and may hear a lot about when you think about research is an interventional study or a clinical trial. 
remember, as I stated, clinical research is research that's done with people. And so clinical trials involve taking a therapy to see how it affects Parkinson's disease. The therapy could be a medication, it could also be a surgery, or even an exercise. And some examples um, that fall under clinical trials, and I think it's important to remember the word testing, clinical trials test a type of exercise to see if treatment symptoms of Parkinson's disease improves or doesn't improve. And this is just an example. Um, other clinical trials may look at testing a medication. Um, as I mentioned, there are many different types of clinical trials. These are examples, but when you think of a clinical trial, you should know that it's research that's done with people and it usually involves testing some sort of intervention. Now, there are many phases related to clinical trials as uh, we think about the drug development process. And again, when we think about clinical trials, we're talking about testing drugs or medications. This process is really well controlled and regulated by different agencies to ensure that drugs are being developed in a way that is safe for people. The very first phase that you see is preclinical research. Remember, clinical research involves people. So preclinical would be what happens before it even gets to people. And this would be the laboratory studies or what some may call bench science. And then right after that, we move into the phases of a clinical trial. We have a phase one, phase two, phase three. And then we have the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA and then phase four. As we go through each phase of a drug being developed um, in the form of a clinical trial, uh, you can expect more and more people to be involved. And the purpose of each phase is to test the safety, the dosing, so which dose is more um, appropriate or efficient, and then how well the drug is actually working. They also include healthy people in these phases, um, just to ensure that again, that the drug is working well um, and is safe for everyone. After the first three phases, there would be approval by the Food and Drug Administration based on the success of the earlier phases of the clinical trial. And even after that approval, there's another phase where they continue monitoring safety and um, efficacy of the drug. I know sometimes this can be a lot to digest for people, but I think one thing that it's important to remember, all drugs have actually gone through this process. Think about our over-the-counter medications like Tylenol or ibuprofen or even some of our common antibiotics like penicillin. There were people who actually volunteered to take part in these clinical trials to test those medications. So this process does work and we see this um, evidence in our daily lives. There are some key terms that are important to remember when we think about research. And so I'm just gonna go over a few um, and talk, spend some time talking about them with you today. Uh, one of those terms are placebo. So a placebo is a substance or other kind of treatment that looks just like a regular treatment or medicine, but it's actually not. It's made with inactive ingredients um, and placebos are used in clinical trials because they help us determine the real effect of a drug. The other term that's important to know in research is randomization. So randomization means people in a study are put into a treatment group or a placebo group, and they're randomized by chance. If you think of this like a flip of a coin, you have an equal chance of being in either group. And randomization really helps us eliminate bias because you have that equal chance of being in either group. And it allows us to know that one group doesn't have people that are all the same. Again, because there's an equal distribution among the groups. Another term that's important to remember in research is double blind. So double blind means neither the researcher nor the study participant knows who has been put into which groups. This helps ensure that people's expectations about the treatment do not affect the outcome of the study. And there are processes set in place to unblind or reveal which treatment a person has received. And so even if a study is double blind, um, I don't want it to increase you know, your anxiety and, and thoughts about making a decision whether or not to take part. Again, the trial is safe and there are processes set in place to reveal which treatment you've received in the event of an emergency. 
And these processes really help ensure safety of all the people in clinical trials. Now that we've talked about some terms, there are some key players in research that um, you should be made aware of. Uh, the first one is investigators. So investigators are researchers who lead the study. Then we have sponsors. This would be the organizations that fund the research. They can be government organizations, biopharmaceutical companies. You may hear the term industry as well when we think about pharmaceutical companies. It could be academic research institutions or foundations. Then we have contract research organizations. And these are companies that support the operation of a trial. And the way I like to think of it, the contract research organization is actually the bridge between the investigator and the sponsor. They're the people that oversee the operation and, and make sure that the sponsor and the investigator are all on the same page when it comes to a clinical trial. And we have participants and subjects. These are the people who take part in the trial. We also have regulators. These are organizations that guide how research is done. And we've already talked about one regulator, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, again, the drug development process being a tightly regulated system with those phases of research. And that's because the Food and Drug Administration has put that process in place um, to regulate how drugs are being approved and brought to people. We also have ethic boards, and these are panels of people who ensure the safety of participants. A few examples that you may have heard are an institutional review board or a data safety monitoring board. And I wanna spend some time talking a little bit about informed consent. So informed consent is actually your right as a potential participant in a clinical trial or research study. It is required that you give your informed consent prior to taking part in the study. And an informed consent process should look like you reviewing an actual document with all the information about the clinical trial with the investigator or a study doctor. It may even be a research coordinator, but it's really a time for you to sit down, learn more about the study, discuss a number of questions you may have, and really make, again, an informed decision of whether or not you wanna participate. And I think uh, participating in a clinical trial is an important thing to actually discuss with your neurologist because your neurologist can really help you evaluate a study and possibly recommend additional studies for you. Additionally, I think it's important that you also involve your family in the decision-making process. Your family uh, may be the ones that you may go to for emotional support, but your family may also be involved in some of the study logistics, like taking you back and forth to study visits, may need to monitor you after you've um, done a study visit related to a clinical trial. And so your family should be a part of the process in helping you make a decision on whether or not you'd like to take part in a trial. And then I just wanna give you some quick tips or some questions to ask when you're considering research. And I would like to preface this by saying all of these questions are answered in that informed consent document that you will review and sign. Um, but some of those questions will be focused on what are the requirements for participating? You should really think through what it is that you're being asked to do. What's the purpose? Are you being asked to take a medication? How often uh, are you supposed to take that medication? Will you be required to come into the hospital? What does that time look like? Uh, again, really focusing on the requirements and involvement you would have while taking part in the clinical trial. Then think about the direct benefits. Uh, and it's important to know that you may not benefit directly from taking part in a study. You could be given a placebo, which would be those inactive ingredients. That is okay. Remember when we talked about the reasons people take part in the study, some of those reasons may be indirect benefits just like contributing to the diversity in research or helping your family or your community, or you just simply may be helping researchers advance treatments. Then you're gonna ask about the risks of the study. And these should be clearly outlined in the informed consent document. And it's important to walk yourself through those risks. Again, talk about it with your neurologist, talk about it with your family, but really think about your lifestyle and whether or not those risks are appropriate for you. The other questions you're gonna to wanna to ask 
who can see my data and will results be shared? Again, that information will be clearly outlined in an informed consent form. Again, clinical trials are tightly regulated by different agencies and there are ethics panels or ethic boards that review and monitor the safety of your data and how information will be shared. But it's important that you know these things to allow yourself to make an informed decision on whether or not you'd like to take part in a clinical trial. There are a few ways you can find a Parkinson's study. One of those ways is clinicaltrials.gov. That is a database of privately and publicly funded clinical studies conducted around the world. If you access this website, you'll have the ability to search for research studies that are being done around the world that are specifically related to Parkinson's disease. And you'll be able to view the inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and see if this is a study that you would like to take part in. The National Institutes of Health Clinical Research Trials in You is an online resource to help people learn more about clinical trials. And you can also visit our website, parkinsons.org slash research to learn more and find the latest in Parkinson's research um, if you're interested in joining a Parkinson's research study. I'm gonna pass it over to Jim to talk a little bit about one of our own initiatives, one of our own clinical trials, um, PD Generation, which is a national initiative to offer genetic testing and counseling at no cost to people with Parkinson's. So I invite Jim back to talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Evelyn. I appreciate that. And it was a great primer um, for everybody to talk about clinical research. And this, I think, is a great example. So before I jump into the trial itself, I wanna give people a little bit of a background about why uh, we are offering this trial to begin with. So what we know um, is that everyone's journey with Parkinson's is unique, but what's also unique about every individual are their genes. And so we think genetics may serve as a key to understanding the biology of Parkinson's disease. And certainly we hope be able to use it to diagnose and potentially treat uh, people with Parkinson's disease. And one approach that has been uh, used is in the area of precision medicine. Next slide. So you may have heard about precision medicine in, in the realm of cancer, where a particular individual may have a, a type of cancer, um, they get it genetically tested, and then a drug is prescribed specifically to target that cancer to stop the growth of malignant cells. And we think the same thing is gonna be happening with Parkinson's disease. Um, and so if you can see the next build, our goal here is to be able to take and personalize um, medicines based upon a person's genetic status or other characteristics about their disease in order to provide a personalized medicine that can eliminate Parkinson's disease. And so in the next slide, we see that really what we think as a community is that precision medicine may be really our greatest leap to a cure for Parkinson's disease. There are a number of trials that are underway uh, that are actually looking to recruit individuals who have a certain genetic basis to their Parkinson's disease. And some of these are lifted, listed here. You can find more about uh, these uh, trials also on clinicaltrials.gov um, as, as well as part of that. And so in order to, for people to understand whether they have a genetic link to a Parkinson's disease, because genetic testing is not something that's routine in clinical care for a person with Parkinson's disease. So the foundation is trying to jumpstart this process to accelerate clinical trials to help us reach further and faster to a potential cure for Parkinson's disease by this study, PD Generation. Through PD Generation, as Evelyn said, we're offering uh, genetic testing uh, at no cost to a person with Parkinson's combined with genetic counseling. Because uh, we really believe it's important for people to understand what was tested and what are the results of that test so that individuals with Parkinson's are empowered based upon that knowledge to be able to go forward and participate in clinical trials that may be relevant to them. On the next slide, you can see some of our objectives. Um, you know, really uh, looking to recruit as many people as possible um, to uh, offer free genetic testing and counseling. We're very close to our initial goal of, of 15,000 people of with Parkinson's disease. In fact, I think we will hit that goal uh, in the next uh, three to six months. So we're well ahead of schedule as part of that process. And again, the key focus around PD generation is to help improve our understanding of Parkinson's disease, where um, people with Parkinson's can learn more about their disease. Uh, we can also advance research because a, a key aspect of participating in PD generation is sharing of uh, the genetic information with researchers to further explore 
on the genetic basis to Parkinson's disease. In PD generation, we're only testing seven genes which are related to Parkinson's disease. And those are listed here on the right. Um, these are seven genes which are really the most common of rare forms of Parkinson's disease. You may ask yourself, everyone should probably have a genetic link to Parkinson's disease, and they may. But right now, science only shows us that about 10 to 15% of people have a clear genetic link to Parkinson's disease. This is where further research is necessary to understand how broad is that link, to be able to identify new genes that may participate um, in causing Parkinson's disease. These genes listed here are, again, the most common ones and where clinical uh, research is moving forward in order to uh, create interventions for. So as we reach 15,000 and consider going beyond it, you know, we're looking to accelerate our clinical trial recruitment and, and thinking about how to do that and, and partnering with others as part of the process. Our goal here, again, is to provide this liaison between the Parkinson's community and precision medicine trials, where we hopefully will be able to put a halt to PD generation because we'll have seen success in the, in the clinical trial framework where individuals who have a genetic form of Parkinson's may be able to one day stop their disease um, or even prevent it uh, as a result of this. So we really view PD generation as a critical role in the success of, of PD clinical trials. So encourage anyone to take a look at our website uh, at parkinson.org um, forward slash PD generation, and you'll be able to find some more details about it on our website. So now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Evelyn Stevens and uh, Kevin Kwok. Thank you, Jim. Um, so as I promised earlier, you'd be able to learn a little bit more from a research participant. Um, Kevin Kwok, as I mentioned, is also a research advocate. He has gone through training with the Parkinson's Foundation in the research process, giving him the skills and knowledge to partner with researchers and scientists to make Parkinson's research more effective and efficient. He has also participated in many different clinical trials, and so we invited him here today to share more with us about his experience with participating in research. Kevin was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2009 at age 48, and so with that, I'd like to welcome Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hi there. How are you, Evelyn? Great. So I'd like to start just by asking you, how did you decide to participate in research? You know, what really motivated you to take part in clinical trials? I guess the way it all came about was I, I've been involved in clinical trials since the onset of my diagnosis 14 years ago. And what really inspired me the most was um, both from my training, my clinical training as a pharmacist, uh, and also my my almost more than 20 years of of participation in the pharmaceutical industry, where I saw advances coming from very courageous patients who volunteered their time and efforts to participate. And these became the giants that really allow us to be where we are today. And so when I was diagnosed, I sort of said to myself, Kevin, I think it's your turn to step up. So that's how I, it all started. Great, Kevin, thanks for sharing that. It sounds like you were really motivated by others in the past who have um, volunteered their time to take part in clinical trials. And so as I talked about, you know, the direct benefit versus the indirect benefit, it was really that indirect benefit of, you know, it's your turn now to be involved that really inspired you to take part in clinical trials. I'd like to ask you, what kind of research have you participated in? Has it been clinical trials, wow. observational studies, a little bit of both? Yeah, every one of the trials that you described in, in your presentation and in Jim's discussion, I've been involved in. Um, from the observational side, uh, I've been involved in genetic studies, uh, simple online response to questionnaires over a period of time. Um, th those have been the easy ones to get involved with. And if you're having hesitation at first, this is a great way to start. Um, I've evolved into several complex uh, 
interventional trials as well. Uh, these have ranged from uh, simple things like exercise and meditation to blood transfusions um, to very involved drug studies. And more, the longest study that I've been involved in has been a five-year DVS trial. That's deep brain stimulation for those who don't know. But these studies can take many days in a row and and become very involved, very involved and complex. Hey, thanks for sharing that, Kevin. Can you share more about how you chose which trials you chose to get involved in? Because it sounds like you've done a lot, all the way from surveys and more observational type studies to some pretty in invasive clinical trials. And so what were some of the ways or things that made you um, decide um, which trials you wanted to get involved in? Well, once you get involved in the research community, um, there's an evolution of knowledge in places where you find out about things. I would say that in the very early days, it was in, in, uh, invitations by my, my neurologist, which first got me interested. Um, but you have to express interest yourself because there's only so much time when you have with your neurologist to talk about your own treatment, that oftentimes, unless you express an interest, uh, sometimes that, 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 that question goes and it gets put on the back burner till the next visit. Um, once you've expressed that interest and get into a rhythm, you start finding many other studies start falling your way. And that's what happened to me. Um, and being part of the research advocate program really helped me be in front of investigators to learn. What I found in the evolution is that more recently, uh, studies of interest come your way and you start, start to get you, your pick and choose. Uh, I remember attending Grand Rounds once uh, at the university where I was being treated. And there was a really interesting um, interaction with a researcher that was transfusing the blood of young, young animals into older animals to see if it had an effect. And... I hadn't realized that was now moving into humans. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got a call from that investigator the next day saying, hey, can you help us find 15 researchers? Uh, we want to transfer, transfuse plasma from young people to older patients to see if it has an effect. And my, my comment to that coordinator was, I'll help you find your 15 patients but I have to be one of them. <laughs> and so that that's sort of an example of how you move from a passive role to a more active role in selecting the clinical trials that come to you. Great, great. Did I I answer yeah, you answered it perfectly. And I want to talk a little bit about what you said. You were attending Grand Rounds and they were showing um, pretty much the laboratory science, right, of how they were um, transfusing blood from, you know, one younger animal to an older animal. And I want to just point out, we just talked about this when we talked about preclinical research, then moving into the clinical phases of research where they were looking to identify 15 um, people to then uh, do this transfusion. So it's full circle moment that you've mentioned now. We think about what we've just talked about. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, a little bit more time in depth talking about some of your impressions and what you've experienced in the diverse amount of trials that you've participated in. So, for example, what's the research process been like for you, the time commitment and the actual benefits that you have felt when participating in clinical trials? You definitely have to carve out time 
to participate. Many of these trials happen during the work week. And as a young onset Parkinson's patient, I had to make it a priority to say to my employers, I, I like to take a portion of a day. It's kind of like jury duty, right? Where you say it's my obligation to get involved. And oftentimes employers will, will, will commend you for the role that you take to a point. It's if you start missing weeks at a time, that becomes an issue. But that's one of the considerations in getting involved. I think if you take another step back, though, you have to ask yourself, what is the intent of why you're interested in the hypothesis of that trial? Uh, and, and so you have to ask, well, is a being involved in a disease modification study or a symptomatic relief study consistent with what you want as a patient? Uh, those become important questions that you want to align mm -hmm. uh, as you go forward. Um, th there's another part that I, I think is really important for all of your viewers here. Uh, and that is if you don't understand what's happening or you're getting lost in the jargon, and clinical trials has a ton of jargon uh, that the um, lay person may not fully appreciate or understand. And it's your job as a patient to say, stop, can you take a step back and explain to me what randomization is? what a placebo is, all the terms that you described. Uh, because if you don't, they'll just, they'll, they'll, they'll assume you have that knowledge. So I think coming to understanding the, um, the full meaning behind why they're doing the trial is so important. And then finally, there's another, one of the intangibles in the is when you get involved in clinical trials, you feel as though you're becoming part of the team. Uh, and what I have noticed is it's never been the intent of a clinical trial to offer you better care. But I have found um, that if I need access to see a neuro the, the neurologist who may be the principal, one, one of the investigators, it, I almost have no hesitation of getting in right away, which to me has, is, is they value you as a patient now more than just being a patient, but also being a team member of there. Uh, so there's that feeling of, of, of camaraderie uh, which really was one of the intangibles that I had never expected. Yeah, I'm glad you shared that. It was It's really empowering when you think about, you know, taking part in research is giving you a chance to actually partner with the researchers, investigators, and be a part of the science and be a part of a team, that it's not just an individual or, you know, an individualized decision um, that you would only be experiencing, you know, the benefits of of the trial. Again, it's a team decision, and we're all coming together to really advance treatment and hopefully lead us to a cure for Parkinson's. I'd like to also ask you, um, you know, you mentioned that you've taken part in genetic studies. Uh, we also have heard from Jim Beck, who talked a little bit about PD generation. And so I'm just curious, what was your experience like when you participated in a genetic study? Well, gen genetics is really the key to everything. So I applaud the Parkinson's Foundation for the for your efforts in PD generation. The, the way I describe genetics is that you have two components. You have environmental components and you have sort of a... a predisposition um, that that need to be um, 
it's almost like a collision, right? Where, where both are required. Um, it's almost like saying, I hate to use this an an analogy, but, but you have to have something that loads a gun, and then you have to have something that pulls the trigger. Loading the gun is the genetics. It really creates the makeup. And without it, we will never really get to the answer. So uh, it's very simple to do a genetic study. It can be as simple as giving a saliva sample or blood draw. Uh, and then the more important thing is getting a genetic counseling session after that to really translate what, what it means. Uh, but I'm a big fan of genetic research. Great. Thank you. And I want to ask you, you know, we've talked about sharing information about research studies with your family and that your family should be involved in decisions. And, you know, when we think about genetic studies, it's it's information that could be valuable for your family members. And so were you able to have, you know, that discussion with your family? And what did that look like for you? You know, the, your family, if they're loving and caring as they should be, they're going to be trying to protect you. Sometimes, more often than not, they tell you, don't get so involved. But I always explain to them is the reason why I'm doing all these studies is because my hope is that one day you will not have to deal with the issues in, of Parkinson's that I've had to live through. So it really is the, um, I mean, research to help yourself is one, is, is one priority, but to help the next generation, uh, if you can eliminate a single person from getting Parkinson's because you help them understand their risks and they can avoid something, that's as good as a cure. I agree. I agree. Couldn't agree more, Kevin. So how has participating in research impacted your life personally? Well, uh, I, I would say that it's been a huge component of my well-being of living well with Parkinson's today. You know, it started off as a curiosity, right? Wanting to know more about what was out there that could possibly in the future help me out. That's how it started. But I found myself finding there were other hidden gifts there. You know, I, I felt like I became part of, of a research community. Uh, and to me, that really uh, helped, helped me cope with having par Parkinson's so much. You know, there's this feeling that many people, when they get diagnosed with Parkinson's, uh, that they've lost control of their life. All of a sudden, now the disease is taking control. And I would say that over the 15 years now that I've been living with Parkinson's, I feel that by being involved in clinical research, I've actually done the most that I can do to regain control. And that's a very satisfying place to be. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, so much. You know, it's been such a joy talking to you today. We are so very glad at the Parkinson's Foundation to have you a part of our research community. Um, any last minute thoughts, recommendations to anyone considering taking part in the clinical trial? Well, I, I would say getting involved in something like the Parkinson's Foundation's Research Advocate Program is a great start for anyone. Uh, I've met some really great people through your program, and it really has launched me into my trajectory for doing what I do. Um, you, you know, if you get involved, more will come to you. And that, to me, is... Uh, just the gift. If if you can use Parkinson's as a gift, uh, many people wouldn't think of it that way. Uh, but I feel very very uh, grateful uh, that that I've had this opportunity. So thank you all at the PF.
Thank you, Kevin. I'd like to turn it back over to Krista um, to transition us, I think, to our question and answer. Yeah, and we'll bring Jim back if he's still present. <laughs> Kevin, thank you so much for all that you have done and continue to do for the Parkinson's community. You're you're beyond an inspiration in advancing treatment options um, for our our family who and friends who are living with Parkinson's. So just from the bottom of my heart, I I want you to feel the gratitude um, that I'm feeling for your participation and involvement. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Jim, uh, an interesting question that tends to come up a lot when we talk about genetic testing. What's the difference between PD generation and 23andMe or all the other genetic tests that are readily available? So uh, that's a great question, uh, Krista. I would say there's not a lot of other tests that are readily available um, beyond PD generation and maybe 23andMe. 23andMe um, tests uh, a, a, a couple of Parkinson's genes looking for one specific mutation in each of two different genes. There are dozens of mutations in these genes. And so the difference really is that we sequence the entire gene for um, PD generation and return all relevant results back to a person with Parkinson's and it includes counseling. Um, so I think, you know, as Kevin mentioned, that's a, uh, an important step as part of the process. So um, while 23andMe is great and um, it's, a, it's a good place to start, uh, PD generation is just a much more comprehensive test um, of looking for genetic based to Parkinson's. Thanks for that clarification and understanding that, you know, genetic testing is not readily available. <laughs> I, Evelyn, I'm curious, are there trials that can be done virtually for those who, you know, don't have access to a medical organization or institution, uh, or perhaps driving is just not an option? Are there virtual options to participate in research? Yes, there are many clinical trials that are offering virtual options, and even more so since we've had COVID, um, you would be able to figure out whether or not a trial is virtual or has the ability to be virtual by talking with, you know, your neurologist, looking at that informed consent document as well. Um, it'll contain information on whether or not there is a virtual component, but I would say collectively, the field is really moving forward to uh, decentralized clinical trials. And what I mean by that is offering options where people have more access to take part in trials. Can I add a comment to that? Sure. Uh, three of the last trials that I've been involved in have all been virtual. Oh, with the onset of COVID, I did a mindfulness study uh, where it was involvement once a week, you know, for eight weeks in mindfulness sessions. Well, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I was also involved in a cannabis study where people came to my home. Uh, and it was really simple and easy to do. And, and more recently, I've been involved in a bone, bone fracture study sponsored by the NIH Topaz to look at it. And again, it was effortless. I didn't even have to leave the home for those three. Yeah, Thanks, I, Kevin. I, I, I just to add that, uh, you know, because the foundation is involved in, in Topaz as well. And that's a, a really great opportunity to see if we can prevent fractures in people with Parkinson's. And as Kevin said, it's something you don't have to leave the home for. PD generation is another one. A kit gets sent in the mail and, and people are able to participate. So. Um, let's hope we continue to see that trend. And Jim, on the subject again of PD generation, are minors or children able to participate in PD gene? No, uh, you have to be 18 or older. And you have to have a Parkinson's disease diagnosis. So that's a, a important distinction. Um, we have limited resources and our, our first goal is really uh, better understand people who live with Parkinson's disease, see if we can improve their understanding of the disease and, and those of researchers. Thanks. And while I have your mic hot, Jim, how exactly does PD generation work? What's what's the process in, in getting involved with PD generation? Yeah, it's really straightforward. Um, we have a number of locations uh, where you can actually go talk to your doctor and, and start the process uh, there. Um, and if you know your, one's doctor's appointment's not soon, um, you can go onto our website and go through initial steps, uh, screening questions, and 
uh, watch a video to learn a little bit about what the study is there for, and then arrange an opportunity for a consent call, much like this uh, via Zoom, and have an opportunity to talk to someone. Informed consent is important, and informed is really the important aspect of it. And as Evelyn said, this is something where you know, talking to your family is important as well. Because when you talk about genetics, you're not just talking about an individual anymore, you're talking about a family. So it's good to you know, uh, discuss these things uh, with one's family. And then from there, uh, a kit gets shipped. Um, and then uh, you pr provide the material. Right now, we're just requiring a, a fancy Q-tip inside the uh, cheek to swab. And um, results come back about six to eight weeks later. Uh, visit scheduled again, just like this. Uh, if one did it through our website with a uh, genetic counselor. And it's an opportunity to bring um, family members in, if you'd like, to, so they can hear uh, that process and you get the results back. Um, like I said, most people will find out that they don't have a, a genetic link based upon our uh, genes that we're testing. This doesn't say, mean that people don't have a genetic link, but you know, science is still moving forward and, and this is the knowledge that we have right now. Thanks, Jim, for outlining the process for us. I'm curious about that fancy Q-tip <laughs> that you offered. Kevin, I, I want to ask, a, you know, we have a question from uh, one of our viewers. As an advocate in the community, is there something we should know to sort of help spread the word about getting involved in research? Uh, well, I, I think that it's really important to know that this is not a conversation about mad scientists and subjects or or patients. We're part of the um, science. Clinical trials has evolved to the point where this consideration all along the way on on getting an understanding of of safety, of, uh, of consideration of time. You know, there's so many factors and nuances you can dig deeper into. I, for one, always, will, if I'm involved in a later stage trial, I would almost insist on, on a crossover, right? Where if I were put on a placebo, if I somehow got randomized into the untreated group, that after the study was ended, there was a chance that I could get, get involved um, through my participation. These are things that I talk to companies about all the time, is doing studies that really show that you mean what you say when you say that you want to partner with patients. I could go into much more conversation on that because I don't want to tie up the time here, but it's really an important question. Thank you, Kevin. Evelyn, along the lines of design study, say if you if you join a study, most of the trial has been developed, and you have suggestions on design format, what's the best way to share ideas with the study team? I would say speak directly to the research investigators um, about those suggestions that you may have. Uh, you In the informed consent document, you should actually be provided with the investigators' contact information. And I think it's a great opportunity to reach out to them, tell them about your experience. I think it's really important for people to remember that you are the expert. You live with Parkinson's. You've lived with it uh you know day to day and that you know using your lived experience and your lived expertise you have a lot of feedback that you could offer based on the design of a study um, i will also say our goal with our research advocacy program is to prevent that this is why we want to work with people with parkinson's and care partners so that we can get them involved in working right alongside researchers and scientists in those early early phases of clinical trials so that when we get to a phase three um, clinical trial, we're not in the space where people are feeling like the study is not a good fit for them or there are things that they wish could be changed about the design of studies. Yeah, I would urge that if you have any industry viewers of this podcast, uh, that they understand early is better. 
And just for uh, sake of definition, Evelyn or Jim, would you just define or describe what a research investigator is or a principal investigator is or who they are? Sure. Um, I think we talked about it in the study. So an investigator is the actual person who's leading the study. Um, oftentimes it's the lead doctor. It may be someone who has a um, advanced degree or like a PhD, um, but they're the ones who have come up with the idea, um, presented it to a sponsor for funding, um, and really the primary person that oversees the uh, clinical trial. For offering that. As we're rounding out our time together and getting involved in research, just want to share a few moments. Perhaps each of you could offer some final words of encouragement and getting involved in research. Jim? Yeah, absolutely. I have to say that, you know, the uh, opportunity to participate in research is uh, really a gift. It's a gift that keeps on giving. It's not only uh, great for the participants a lot of the times, as, as Kevin mentioned, it, it's not that you go in getting uh, um, you know, the expectation that you're going to get uh, concierge care, but people pay attention. Uh, they want uh, to address your needs, but it's also something that helps the community as a whole. Uh, I, I, again, I turned to Kevin who pointed out that you know, if his participation in a trial could keep one person from developing Parkinson's disease, that would be, uh, you know, goal one achieved. The more the merrier, of course. But, um, you know, this is the thing to recognize that um, how do we ha envision a world without Parkinson's? It's by having people participate in clinical trials so we can put an end to it altogether. Kevin? Yeah, I think I've, I've mentioned all the things that I along the lines here, but um, it, it is controlling your life better. I, and the other part to it is that I find that by helping other patients, I feel like I'm helping myself. Uh, and so that that sense of being part of the community, and helping fellow members is is something that it's hard to put in words, but it really does help us. Evelyn? Yes. Um, I think I'd just like to say, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about clinical trials, what they are, the benefits of taking part to advance treatment and find a cure for Parkinson's. Um, I think it's important to know that it's, a decision that you have to make on whether or not you want to take part. And we want you to be as informed as possible in making that decision. Um, and that it's okay to be hesitant. If you're unsure, that's an okay feeling. And I know that there are many out there um, who, you know, may just not trust research, may not trust science. And that could be based on some valid feelings that you may have of things that have been done in the past. And um, you know, we acknowledge those feelings. They're okay to have. And I think, you know, have these conversations with your family, have these conversations with your neurologist and really think about, you know, whether or not you want to take part and make that informed decision. Thank you all so very much for your time and wisdom. Dr. Beck, Evelyn, Kevin, for just showing up today to advocate for participation in research that we can drive home more uh, advancements and treatment options for people with Parkinson's. So thank you so much. Also a huge thank you to our, um, our sponsor for today, Prevail Therapeutics for supporting the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. We really appreciate all that you do in advancing research uh, for people with Parkinson's. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if your Parkinson's is progressing or you're new to the community here. Feel free to browse our comprehensive webpage at parkinson.org. We have all kinds of resources there that are free and readily available at your fingertips. You can also call our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. It's staffed by Parkinson's disease specialists or email us at helpline at parkinson.org. And as we end today's webinar, your Zoom screen will prompt a survey. Our programming is fueled by your feedback. Everything that the foundation does is fueled by the direct input of people living with Parkinson's and those impacted by the disease. We appreciate you taking the time to let us know what you hope to learn in future sessions. Until then, take care, and we will see you at the next Wellness Wednesday webinar. Until then, I'll see you in Zoom land soon again.